Um, I wanted to start with this slide. I couldn't remember how far into it I got last week, but um, there does seem to be a comparison, you know, really since Karen Armstrong wrote her book until now, I would say, between kind of the secularist um, vision of God versus the fundamentalist um, vision of God. So I wanted to kind of remind everybody of some of this. So because we have we have um, we have them kind of going back to the, the secularists are aren't necessarily atheists. Some of them are, some of them are not. But what they're doing is they're going back to the original philosopher's viewpoint of God is this being that is wholly other. And that it, you know, while he's a human ideal, it's not something that is that is personal, like what has happened a lot in um, in the Christian faith, you know, for example. But like somebody like Ernest Bloch, who was a Marxist, you know, and that that always got kind of a scary tone when people said you're a Marxist, you know, but. What a lot of people don't understand about the pure Marxist theory is that socialism was really about a, a utopia that the people could create um, together. And so he made the comment where there is hope, there is religion. So it, it, it's, it's about the human ideal. It's about the human condition that, that he thought we could break, bring the Marxists and uh, the socialists, and even the, the concept of communism is about a utopia that human beings can create. So, you know, it is true that God then becomes secondary um, in, in a lot of the, the um, especially the communist ideal, but he's not forgotten in socialism or secularism. He's just you look at Horkmeyer and he said it's it's an important ideal, but not important whether he actually existed. And then he said, without the idea of God, there is absolutely no, there's no absolute meaning, truth, or morality. Ethics becomes simply a question of taste, mood, or whim. So this is a secularist saying this that God is still an important ideal that we have to kind of put up there to say, this is what the meaning of, of true morality is. Otherwise we all just dive down into amoral behavior. And so I had a question as I was reading this, do we agree that we can't have any morality unless we include the idea of God in, in our lives? You know, which it, it, it's kind of a, the secularists are go back and forth on this. Some of them think that the human condition can do it on its own. And then others say, like this Horkmeyer guy, no, you actually have to have the ideal of God in order to know what morality is. Otherwise, you know, politics and uh, morality, they remain pragmatic and shrewd rather than wise. And I think we can all agree that people are teetering on that in both parties anyway, you know, you know, so I'm not sure it has anything to do with their belief systems, but, but I do think that's an interesting question that I wanted to pose to you guys. What do you, what do you think about that question? I don't, I don't one think interesting. A, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeremy. I was going to say one interesting thing is that in Russia, there is no word for truth. The only word is Pravda, which means the official word. Ah, so, yeah. <laughs> That's a little Orwellian. <laughs> I always thought it meant truth, which is interesting because it, it gets translated to me as truth. Well, that's the truth is whatever the official word is. Yeah. <laughs> You can go around in circles on that one. <laughs> okay, uh, Paul, Paul, did you have something? Um, so I was going to say, I, I mean, I know people, good, good people who believe in God, and that is the basis of living a moral life. 
I know bad people who claim to believe in God and are immoral or amoral. Um, and, and then the atheist movement would say, uh, we, we don't need the idea of God to be good people. Yeah. So I think there are all sorts of variations on this. I don't think it's an absolute, um, I, mean, I mean, I don't think the statement should be taken in, in an absolute form. And I was yeah. going to say, you were talking about Ernest Bloch being a Marxist. Martin Heidegger was a Nazi. <laughs> and and interesting enough, I know about this guy because um, he's in one of my lectures that I teach to my students in my research course. And his mentor was a guy by the name of Edmund Husserl, and Husserl was Jewish. And it's interesting that the two of them were able to get along in spite of their uh, political differences and religious differences. That is interesting. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Paul that this is this is too blunt of a statement. You know, I mean, it's interesting. You, you know that some people do believe that, that there is no morality without the idea of God. But I do know good people who find, you know, this humanist morality, you know, and we have lots and lots of discussions about it. And in some some secularists some atheists think those who those of us who believe in God are naive, you know, which is kind of an interesting, it's always an interesting conversation, you know, because <laughs> I think I've grown out of my naivete, but it, it's just, to me, it's something, once again, that's very individual. And I think that, I think that we're going to, our next slide is going to be the fundamentalist. So look at the distinctions between how the secularists look at the world versus fundamentalists. So, so we've got this, this uh, we are all of course familiar with the Christian fundamentalism movement. You know, I think it was during, yeah, it was during Reagan years. So eighties was, was Jerry Falwell's moral mm -hmm. majority. And most of us lived through a, a lot of what he was saying and, and, um, Who's the, who's the Florida lady who was the, the, the lady who talked about oranges a lot? <laughs> Anita Bryant? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we've kind of lived through that era of what, um, what, what the fundamentalists started as, you know, and, and they're, they're saying that, that they, they're taking Jesus's remarks literally in the beginning, and then they're taking the whole Bible um literally and it's intolerant in its vision it's it's very very specific to the bible and we have seen that develop even more than what ms armstrong saw i think in her um in her in her book and so um quick to condemn enemies you know they believe that jews and muslims are destined for hellfire I mean, I'm not sure any of this has changed since the 90s, you know, since when she when she was writing this. There, there are different degrees of fundamentalist, fundamentalists, but it comes down to the Bible is the is the word of God and we cannot deviate from it. And um, anybody who does is either destined for hellfire or they're, you know, in a cult or they're, you know, they're just not true Christians kind of a thing. Hey, so yeah, go ahead. I have a question for you. Who's this? This is Dennis. Oh, hi, Dennis. Okay. So if you think the Bible is perfect and without error, are you guilty of idolatry? Are you what about adultery? Idolatry. Not adultery. Oh, idolatry. <laughs> you say what what idolatry so the bible itself is your idol right mm -hmm. i would i would i would uh i would question that you know i i'm not sure how to, how did the bible itself become you know the direct i mean i, I get it that it's it's inspired by god and and we've all been, you know, wanting, we've all been reading the Bible to see what God is talking about kind of a thing, you know, but, but when you rely on the Bible only, I mean, at least in our church, obviously with, with, uh, 
present day prophecy that we believe in and, and God still speaks to us. And I don't know, I, is it idolatry? What's the answer, Dennis? Well, I, I thought that some, the Muslims, some Muslims believe that the Quran is the actual literal word of God, but there's other Muslims, I believe, that say that that is idolatry in their religion. I, me, I, if you worship, the, if you believe the Bible is perfect, uh, you're worshiping the Bible, then it seems to me that would become idolatry. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And remember, the, the Quran was actually written by one man, by Muhammad. And we don't have that in the Bible. We have, we have many, many authors in the Bible, and then they all got, you know, we have the vote to which chapters to put in. So we're, we're kind of even removed from the Quran in terms of whether it's the actual word of God. So I always thought that was interesting that the fundamentalist Christians could say it was um, inerrant, you know, but they couldn't really say who all of the authors were, you know. So well, it, do, it doesn't make sense to me. I think we should keep in mind in Latter-day Saintism how the early church felt about the Book of Mormon and Absolutely. that it was the answer to all of the mistakes that were made in the Bible. Yeah, and some people believe that still. Well, and the same with the inspired version, that it was corrupted. Yeah. As I grew older, though, I always wondered why he, he stopped. <laughs> you know? He corrected Matthew and Genesis, and wasn't that about it? He ran out of time. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> he got tired. He got tired. Okay. So she she wrote this book in the 90s. And so I made a little note that it was before 9-11. But she'd already said in, in her book, which was, which was, of course, you know, seeing into the future a little bit, that Muslim fundamentalists have toppled governments, assassinated or threatened enemies of Islam with the death penalty. And we know how far that has gone now. So fundamentalism, in my mind, is probably the strongest um, part of all of our religions, all of the monotheist religions right now. If, if, I, I think in terms of at least political power, they are. And, and it is interesting that the Jewish fundamentalists are, they're the ones that are settling in the occupied territories they're the ones that say that they have to pave the way for the you know, advent of the Messiah. That's why they're kind of gathering you know, back to Israel. So they're driving out the Arab in inhabitants. So if you're gonna be a J Jewish fundamentalist, you're going to, you're gonna believe wholeheartedly that that's your land and that's where the Messiah is coming, you know, so. Black and white. Everything is black and white in the fundamentalist world. So we see it. We see it on the news. So here's some of the dangers of fundamentalism. Um, there is only one message. God and uh, this this guy, Rabbi, he was he was a Jewish fundamentalist. He said that God wanted us to come to the U.S to create a Jewish state. So that didn't go over too well. <laughs> so, um, our author says that this kind of re religiosity is actually a retreat from God. When you say things like family values and holy land and even that ISIS state that, that we now hear, it focuses on the, the, you know, the devotion but it, 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 well, this is what, this is what you were saying earlier, Dennis, it's actually idolatry. And you have to go back to the beginnings of the religions because Yahweh was a very tribal deity in the beginning. Uh, you know, I mean, if he told some, if he told somebody in the old Testament to kill somebody, then that was God saying to kill somebody. Well, are we different now? <laughs> Well, certainly the Muslim fundamentalists aren't any different because they praised Allah, you know, while they were killing Americans, you know, so that was all about their God telling them to do that. So um, Latter-day Crusaders are returning to this primitive ethos 
and what they they're trying to elevate the value of their tribe and their man-made ideals over this transcendent reality that you know religion over the years has been trying to to teach us you know the the the, mo- the main theme of monotheism according to Karen Armstrong should be it's compassion and you know of course we know that Jesus's main theme was compassion and love but we we lose track of that in fundamentalism so so we go to church but then we denigrate people who are not in our tribe that's 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 the criticism that's what it, that's what happens with fundamentalism um do we do we embrace the ethical the, the ethical demands of a compassionate message? You know, and of course, I'm asking in our own religion, but the compassionate mes- message of Christ, or do we worship our version of our religion? You know, do we want to, you know, in, indulge in this belief that 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 the God is in our image rather than, you know, really studying what the words of God were, you know, the, the compassion that the, you know, you know, all, all of these religions, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian all had very compassionate messages. I mean, if you remember, Muhammad used to say that, that there shouldn't be any warring between the, the monotheistic religions. They all, they all believed in the same God. We have somehow we have somehow forgotten what Muhammad said. Everybody has, you know. I think it would shock a lot of Christians to know that that Muhammad said that. So here we are with more dangers, alienation. So here we are. We're we're, we're basically all just you know retreating to our tribes. Um, God becomes the divine tyrant. We, we lose our balance. There's this unhealthy emotionalism that happens, you know, whenever we become so critical of the other religion and it's, and it's all about our own version of our religion. Um, science didn't agitate the Muslims like it did the Jews and Christians in the early years, but the it's the political unrest. And I don't, I do not know how far back it goes, but of course, you know, knowing the story of Osama bin Laden, you know, the interesting thing to me about his story is that he he began his beliefs systems when America was actually in Afghanistan trying to push the Soviet Union out. So it was that political unrest that created Osama bin Laden in the 80s, you know, and so that just really struck me when she said that is that, you know, these superpowers come in and I, I, I think we were trying to help, you know, get rid of, because we didn't want Soviet Union in Afghanistan, but then it becomes this, everybody is too powerful for him and they become that infidel, they become that, that um, you know, he, he created that jihad against, against the West and the, the people who were trying to take over. So it, it be, it created his mentality. Um, so we've got it. We've got to kind of look at that whole issue. And this is something I personally have to look at: is it is the West's trend to take the Bible literally, which clashes with science. Perhaps God is Newton's great mechanic, but the author rejects the notion on religious and scientific grounds. The challenge of science, in her opinion, would shock the churches that a fresh appreciation of symbolic nature of scriptural narrative. Do you guys understand that that she she seems to be saying that in her mind, God is not the great mechanic. It's not that, uh, that, that entity, that being that created it all, it, it's actually a, a more, you know, symbiotic relationship between science and religion. So it's a, it's, it's different. I've always thought of, you know, there's, you know, there's, we don't need to, science and religion don't have to clash because science sometimes explains religion and uh, we're just kind of catching up in our minds. That's what I've always thought, but 
it might be a little more complex than what I thought. So I was just kind of wondering what you guys thought about that, that um, kind of a fresh appreciation of the symbolic nature of scriptural narrative versus science. Is, is there something in that, in that opinion that speaks to you guys? So I, I do think that many of the works of the Bible are uh, symbolic in nature. Uh, take even the, the creation Genesis. Speak up a little bit, Jonathan. Okay, I, I do think that the some parts of the Bible are symbolic, such as the creation story. Uh, I, I'm not sure, as I read her quote, I think she may be saying that God is not the great mechanic behind things, and I, I have a little bit of a dif difficulty with that. Yeah. Yeah, she seems to be saying I, I, that. I think that uh, that goes to Newton saying that he made everything and then he just let, let it go by itself. I mean, it's a clockwork yeah. uh, universe that God created, but then he just sort of left it to do its own thing. And that's what she's disagreeing with. Right, right. So maybe more involved. There's more of a relationship. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I've always thought that Armstrong was trying to say that we should understand God much less literally and more use our imaginations more and to be understanding more metaphorically or symbolically. Is, okay. That that's what comes through her her book over and over is we're, we're very uh, we're not using our imagination near enough in thinking about God is one of the okay. things she said. Okay. Then, you know, then she, she talks about other other modern dangers and, and we've kind of dealt with this in our own religion that, that we've uh, kind of taken the, the masculine version of, uh, of, you know, of scriptures and even our, our favorite hymns and things like that and our prayers, you know, because it's unacceptable for why does, why does the person, why does the deity always have to be a him? You know, I mean, why does it always have to be father? And so it's been male since the tribal pagan days. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear why that happened. <clears throat> Jane, did you notice the hymn today we sang, or maybe you weren't here, they changed father to maker. I did, I did. I have to say, every Christmas I get a little irritated because I mean, I'm I'm as feminist as the rest of the people, but I like the old versions of the of the Christmas carols because I I just accidentally sing them the other way, you know. <laughs> but I get it, you know. I mean, it it is an interesting issue that you have to kind of say, well, and a lot of people that their their prayers are, you know, I I try to be a little bit broader with my prayer now you know I, I have this tendency to always say you know father that's kind of my default <laughs> but I do I do appreciate that there is a broader version of God than just the male gender God so that's something that we we're aware of now and then she said that mysticism is is kind of hard for society, you know, which it, it, it's interesting that we want the, we want the fast food and instant communication, you know, we want somebody to just give us the answers and that the mystic. And I think, I think that we've kind of experimented with, you know, modern mysticism now, you know, and I see it as this, this, this way of, of stepping back and, and uh, she calls it cultivating your own sense of God somehow. Uh, and that's where you get that personal relationship. So, you know, you, we do it through meditation. We do it through, you know, drawing mandalas like I do and, you know, different things, different versions of mysticism. And, but it, but it takes time, you know, and a lot of us with our, with our crazy busy lives, we're not going to take that time, you know? And so it's really more about, writing a poem, you know, I mean, I think I told you one guys, one time I went to a silent retreat and it took me a couple of days to even stop the agitation in my mind. <laughs> 
so that I could stop and journal and kind of listen to myself and to and to basically the relationship that I was trying to create with God. And it, it's quite an exercise, but it's hard, you know. So she asks us, what is our tribe? How, you know, I mean, we're the, we're the community of Christ tribe together. Does that take us, does that take us out of um, this? Does it make us more tribal than, than anything else? Uh Uh-oh. Okay. I did that, right? Are we still tribal in our own religion? Are, is, um, is America very, very tribal now? That's, uh, wh- where do we go from here? That's, that's kind of the first question I wanted to ask. And then I'll, and then I'll throw it over to Jonathan for the rest of the questions. <laughs> We're definitely chiefs fans. That's our tribe. Nobody has another tribe. I can I can name several tribes of mine. <laughs> but do we try as a as a community of Christ not to be tribal? That was that was the question in my mind when I read that. Hmm. I think we've sort of grown into it. It used to be that we were. Uh, we were the church that was that wasn't Mormon, right? And yeah. now we are a little bit more general. Yeah, general. we were the we were the one true church too. Remember? Right. <clears throat> so, was the word ecumenical? I think we're. I mean, from the leadership standpoint of Community of Christ, I think we're an ecumenical church where we participate in the World Council of Churches, and I think they. Um, try to have dialogue with people of other faiths and you know when things were a little bit more active in the headquarters before COVID uh, um, you know I think some of the people that they honored uh, with the annual peace award uh, were not all Christians or community of Christ I know there was at least one Hindu uh, that was uh, awarded and um, I know we've uh, awarded other uh, people from other uh, faiths I know there was a Catholic recipient one year so I, th- I think we're trying. Definitely from that leadership standpoint, I think we are, you know, and um, I'm hoping that we at Mission Road are, are kind of following in that same path. You know, I, I think it's good to welcome in people who are not community of Christ. I feel, I feel happy that Marilyn still likes hanging out with us. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the Catholic was Sister Mary Colleen. She was a friend of Dorothy in mind, and mainly, mostly Dorothy's because she was with in Africa with Dorothy. She founded the Kuru School. Uh, I wanted to backtrack just a little bit to the creation story. Uh, I got an insight, I think it's an insight, uh, from a class that we had on the Bible many years ago. And uh, I got the, the uh, the the vision that the story in the inspired version is uh, very interesting in that it shows the creation shown from the inside out. In other words, it was explaining the creation of the earth and it specifically says just the earth, not the rest of the universe. Uh, and showing it from uh, from the viewpoint of somebody on the earth rather than from somebody outside of the earth. So it's a fairly specific uh, creation story, not just the creation of the universe and the brand. <laughs> hmm. Other comments or are we ready to move on to more questions? Bring on the questions. Okay, so 
I have 13 questions, about 10 slides, and we're going to uh, spend lots of time discussing each one of them. So first question is, what did you learn from the study of the history of God? We've, we've spent um, some interesting, torturous times going through these very long times. <laughs> so what have you learned about, from the study of God, the history of God? Well, over the thousands of years of human history, people have been trying to connect with God. Mm -hmm. And we still don't really know who God is. I mean, we, we worship God, we attempt to understand God, but there is a whole lot we don't know. God is, as, as we learn more and more about the universe, I realize that my God has to become bigger too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. That whole song with these kids, I, I think the universe expands. My concept of God has to expand too. Other comments? One thing I got out of it was that whether you were Muslim, Jewish, or Christian, of the three faiths that she talked about, it seemed like they still had the same ideas about God. I mean, there's various people that had ideas the same as somebody of another faith in of the three faiths he talked about. They were still coming up with the same concepts. Yeah. It seemed like over and over. Yeah, at, at times there's some real cross-pollination between the three monotheistic religions. At times, it seemed a concept seems to develop independent of the other two religions. And so it, that's kind of a fascinating uh, process. Jonathan, one of the things that um, I think that was interesting to me was the trends in society and what was going on and how those trends influenced each religion, um, whether it was the mystics or the the philosophers or whoever, it was kind of like they would take these twists and these turns to try to apply their religion to those trends. Yeah, very true. I mean, you know, from the, the tribal God of the Old Testament all the way through to contemporary uh, issues about whether God is alive or dead. I mean, it, it's been... Uh, movements within society that, that has affected our view of, of uh, or try to, has a, affected as we tried to understand what God, uh, I don't want to say who he is, but, uh, uh, but who the, the essence of God is. Uh, what did you like or dislike about the author's perspective on God and monotheism? Did you like the author's perspective on, on the history of God? Well, I think she certainly tried to present all sides and at times it was a little difficult for me to understand you know, what her opinion was as opposed to she's just sharing information. So I'm not really sure I understand what she believes or what she thinks about God. Um, I, I think she, uh, you know, sounds like based on her early experiences in religion, I think she is somewhat distant from Christianity. Um, there, you know, I talked about her in the first chapter, or, or maybe it was the outside reading that I had done, um, how she described herself as a, 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 some type of a monotheist, but with a Buddhist perspective. And I thought that was interesting because in the last chapter, there was that uh, one kind of modern day priest uh, philosopher uh, who practiced Buddhism. And I wonder if she was sort of a disciple of his maybe. Yeah. I, I think she did a good job of trying to bring in all three monotheistic religions. Um, and I, I think if you read the very last chapter, you do get kind of a, the impression that she is more into the mystical end uh, and not looking for a concrete concept of, of God. 
I'm going to keep moving along, but feel free to go back if, if something occurs to you on any of these questions. Uh, has a study of, a, hit, of a, a history of God changed your views about God personally? If so, how? Any epiphanies or? I think if interest, anything, it's been interesting to me to see how the concepts of God have evolved and changed for humanity. And I sometimes feel like, at least in my own experience, I've been on that journey as an individual as well. And I've had many different ideas and understandings about God in my life. And at times when I thought God was kind of an angry entity, and sometimes God seems very compassionate and close. And, um, you know, so so it's not just humanity that undergoes this. I think we're all kind of doing that in our own mind and, and in our lives, at least, at least for me, that kind of rung, rung true. Well, I've, I've never thought about how society affected different religions in that time period. So, you know, Constantine, how that affected the Muslims, how that affected the Jewish, how that affected Christianity. It was interesting to see it in, in time frames. I also, I, um, oh, go ahead, Marilyn. Um, I, I actually learned some things about my own religion that I really never thought about until mm -hmm. I read this book about how um, the Catholic Church has a lot of mysticism in their ceremony and their repetition and things like that, which makes me understand why some people that aren't Catholic are a little confused with our mass. And so, um, I mean, I understood why before, but I didn't understand the whole, you know, where a lot of it came from. And it makes a lot of sense to me now um, where a lot of it through history came from. Jane, you had a comment? Yeah, I mean, I've always loved studying the history of religions and, and all the different religions, but this book kind of opened my eyes to um, the, the philosophers, you know, that chapter about the God of the philosophers and, and how, you know, we go all the way back to Plato to, to, um, to get a concept of who God was. It just made me think that, you know, really both philosophy and religion, they're just much more tied together than they used to be. So it basically just opened up a new area of study for me. I'm gonna to have to study the philosophers a little more carefully in the future. So <laughs> I've given myself that task. <laughs> Dennis, did you have a comment? Well, she had an insight that I kind of gained was our concepts of God, we hold those concepts as long as they work for us. And when they quit working for us, then our concepts change. <laughs> yeah. And she had that in a lot. She pointed that out. This is not related to this class because I don't get to attend it all that much. Uh, but there's another thing that that sort of an insight that uh, happened to me many years ago when I was reading about the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were fairly newly discovered. And that is that the original concept of God is, uh, well, the, the Lord of hosts literally means the God of armies. So it was very much a, a, a warlike sort of a thing. Nowadays, it's St. Paul and God is love. So that's changed a lot. Yeah. But what's interesting is I, I listen to uh, the message on Sirius radio when I'm driving around. Mm -hmm. And you hear a lot of Christian songs, many of which I love uh, and still love. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating, during the study of this, you start paying more attention to the words and realizing that the, the God described by the song may not necessarily be the God you believe in. Which brings us to the, the was there another comment? Didn't want to cut anybody off. Let's do another question. Do the names we have for God, Heavenly Father, Creator, etc., limit our understanding of God should we expand our vocabulary to include other names for God? 
or goes by any other name. <laughs> I still like I am who I am. Yeah. Hey, uh, I threw in some pictures along here. I'm going to go back to the word, the names of, for God in a second here. But I threw in some pictures that I think describe different views of, of God. What kind of a God is that? <laughs> He's an artist. He's a creator. And... So I'm going to go to, this is from the policy. You limited yourself, Jonathan. You said he. Oh, I know. I know. I'm still learning. Um, <laughs> wait a second. Let's go back and see here. Uh, you're right. It may or may not. Well, uh, yeah, it's a man. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, there's Look at a this. distributed recently um, by the Mission Center, and the World Church in it included the policy of inclusive language in the life and ministry of the community of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I know you can't read all that and we're not going to go through every word in there, but I just thought it's interesting that there are other ways to refer to God that are more inclusive. Now, whether you want to do that or not, that's each individual's choice, but there are other words that can refer to heavenly father or replace heavenly father uh, source of all being, creator and preserver of all kind, deity, eternal one, divine spirit. Um, this is holy one, great God of our hope. Uh, this is just this page and this page are just about half of what was listed in the document. So is that online, Jonathan? Uh, it was it was sent around by Roxanne after the mission center meeting recently and okay it I, I don't know if it's online but i can certainly okay. get it. i can so, find it i i of course went through and picked out just the words for god that i i approve of <laughs> <laughs> and so this list is only about half as long as the entire list but i, I just, <laughs> but this would be searcher of hearts now i want to know the ones you did disapproved of that's all right <laughs> you have to go back and do that research yourself. <laughs> but um, within the Bible, and you can see the references here to John, to Genesis, to Deuteronomy, uh, to Psalms, there are many, many, many ways in which uh, we refer to God. So it doesn't have to be just dear God or dear Heavenly Father or, or whatever your, your choice is. So I, I threw that in just as an aside. What kind of God is that? Intimate. Personal. Personal God touches, willing to touch. I believe that's Adam that he's touching. Yes. Human like. Yeah. Human like. Creator. Personal. Sistine Chapel. All right. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So another question, how do you personally interpret the stories of God of the Bible? Is there a difference in your view based on the Old Testament versus versus the New Testament? And please explain. Well, I think when we read scripture, we have to be aware that we're following people through time on a journey. And concepts don't stay the same. They're evolving and changing. So I don't expect every book of the Bible to be exactly in line with the previous one. Other comments? Well, the Old Testament is more about, I think it's more about an angry God or one that, you know, really wanted us to repent and and i think in the new testament after jesus came it was more of a loving caring um god what about revelation <laughs> what about revelation it sounds kind of like the old uh 
Yeah. You know, I I know some people who constantly talk about how sinful they are, how they are not worthy, um, and they focus on that punishing God of the Old Testament. Is is that your God? No. Other comments on the question? Well, I do think this book taught me that you know, when the Old Testament was written, you know, they, they were coming from that tribal viewpoint. I mean, they were fighting the, the you know, the people who were, who, who were believing in, in multiple gods. So you see that struggle in the writings, you know, of, of Yahweh is the one true God and, and he's going to battle for you. It is it is such a tribal mentality that I do think the New Testament, you know, I mean, obviously Jesus is kind of the new tribe, so we do still have that element. But I think there is a shift in the New Testament to that more personal relationship type of a God. Although I struggle, I do struggle with the parts of the New Testament that say, you know, that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's kind of going back to that tribalism for me. And so it, it doesn't always match with what Jesus himself was saying. So I, I find that a little bit of a clash sometimes in my mind. I think there are multiple viewpoints of who God is in the Old Testament. And some of them are, are angry God. Some are very loving God. It just... There's a whole range of, of views there. I, I'm not going to limit him. Let's say that the Old Testament limits God to just the angry God. I don't think that's true. Well, I think when we studied uh, Amy Jill Levine's book, books, um, she made the point that, uh, quote, Christian charity didn't originate in the New Testament. That, in fact, even the Old Testament talks about caring for the poor and the, the weak, etc. So. I, I agree. There are multiple gods in the Old Testament, just multiple ways in which God is described in the Old Testament, just as the same as in the New Testament. Any other comments? I think we're taught that God doesn't change, but we do. That makes sense. Has the study changed your views of other monotheistic religions, Islam and uh, Judaism? If so, how? Well, there's been people in the other faiths that have had the same thoughts about God that Christians have had. Um, so we don't have a monopoly on certain viewpoints. Um, don't like that either. They're searching just like Christianity is. You Keep coming back to uh, how originally in Islam, they they were trying to accept uh, Judaism and even Christianity as everybody believes in the same God. And it makes me sad that we have all just diverged so much into being enemies of each other. We didn't have to. I think it's been interesting to see how all of the religions went through a lot of the same um, changes in their ideas about God uh, as philosophies changed. You know, they all had uh, periods of time where they had a rational or a sort of a scientific basis for God, and they all had times where they had a mystical basis for God, and, and then they kind of had fundamentalism times. And so it's, I don't know, it just makes me feel a little bit like we share some common experiences, even though we have differences of belief. Other comments on that question? Are you ready for number seven? How do you personally understand the God of your childhood versus the God of your adulthood? Have your personal struggles, tragedies, successes, and joys affected your current view of God?
Well, everyone grows up into an adult at some point, and, you know, it's kind of like Paul said in one of his letters, you know, when I was a child, I thought as a child. And then I grew up and I put away childish things. Well, things become more complicated, or you understand more the complicated issues in life that a small child doesn't know. Okay. And I think we present the story of God and Jesus to children in a very simple manner because that's what they can grasp at right. that point in the adult. And then later on, it becomes multifaceted. Dorothy will know who, who I'm talking about, but there was a Pickles cartoon oh. yesterday, I think, <laughs> where his uh, the grandfather and the grandson are they're on a pair of swings, and the uh, the grandson is the I don't remember the exact words, but is uh, is it good being old, Grandpa? And as uh, the grandpa says, yeah, being being old is great, and being young is great too. It's the from ages ten to seventy that are hard. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. What kind of a god is that? <laughs> you think? That's also from the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. So, where do you think beliefs about God are headed in our modern world? <coughs> I think they're shrinking in the world, which is unfortunate. Explain to me what you mean by shrinking. Well, people, there are so many people. Yeah, I can't hear whoever's speaking, Jonathan. Yeah, Sharon, you want to speak up a little, Sharon? Well, Dorothy and I are over here saying that fewer people are attending church or making room for religion and organized religion in their life. It's all about sports nowadays. Yeah, right. <laughs> so is sports the new golden calf? Yep. Maybe. Emphasis on golden. Yeah. Well, I, I think though it's it's a more personal God that whether people are attending church or not attending church doesn't necessarily mean whether they have a belief in God. And that I think that hopefully people are still focused on God, but taking it on a more personal level than an organized level. <clears throat> does uh, does God have a future? Of course. Oh, I think God certainly has a future. He's the one that's been here the whole time. Um, <laughs> But I, I do think organized religion is kind of at a crossroads now, knowing how to reach out to people and offer a message that seems engaging. Um, I, I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with organized religion. So how can organized religion readjust itself to find relevance, I guess, or lies. Yeah, and I do think that's that's the big challenge. Um, I, I'm just going to, we are basically out of time, so I'm going to run through these questions and, and just suggest those in class, you've got a copy of all the questions in front of you. Take it with you and, and think about it. For those who are online, it'll be posted, all these, this Zoom session will be posted. But you know, in her book, she talks about a personal God, a God of history, a pantheistic God, the God of deism, the God of uh, apatheia, the God of the mystics, the God of the philosophers, the God, God the Father, and more. And so I, I think it's worth considering just what, what your God looks like. And uh, would you live different, your life differently if you did not believe in a personal God or any kind of God? You know, one of the question, questions brought up earlier is, if there was no God, would, uh, you know, can an atheist be a good person? Well, I think yes, an atheist can be a good person. 
But I think that we are brought up in an entire world environment that at least there's a general acknowledgement that there's some kind of creator, God, Allah, something greater than ourselves. And I, I think that that in itself uh, biases the question of whether we can do without a God, because we, we've always had a God in our, in our world, whether it's a tribal one or, or a uh, God the Father or whomever. Uh, but it, it's an interesting thing to consider is, would your life really be different? And that's a hard question to answer too, because I think, how can I imagine my life without the influence of my mother and my father, who are members of the church, uh, people who have influenced me through the years, Chavil, uh, Sheehy, others, people local. How do you how do you move that out and, and consider that? And I I like this image of God. Mm. Um, that's beautiful. It strikes close to home for reorganized Latter Day Saints and Community of Christ. And so two more questions I'm going to throw at you for you to consider. Uh, history of God describes various prophets, theologians, philosophers, scientists who have attempted to explain who God is. Are these attempts helpful or are we better off saying God is a mystery and leave it at that? I'll give you 10 seconds to respond to that if you like. Yes. <laughs> we have one yes vote. God is a mystery and I don't know if we'll ever solve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how should our contemporary view of God affect the future of our congregations? What changes, if any, do we believe he made in our worship and service to accommodate what may be a widely varied contemporary view of God? Because I, I bet if we were all honest, we would sit down and we would describe a different God. Uh, some of us may go for the mystical God, some for a personal God, um, some for a God of history. Uh, some for a, a vengeful God. And all those, I'm pretty doggone sure, are in our congregation. So the question then becomes, you know, how do we as a congregation uh, thrive and survive with those varied views of, of God? Is, so, are we yeah. just having, does our worship service basically reflect more or less one viewpoint? at present and we're not accommodating all our various views? That's, that's another good question. Is the goal to have one view or is the goal to accept all views? Well, if we truly are a tribe, we probably want to have a uniform view. If we are mm -hmm. truly a community, then maybe uh, varied views are, are, are acceptable. At least that would be my response. Sharon and I, we read a book recently, it's called the, okay. It was something like uh, Ladder to the Light. And this was written by a person who is, uh, I forget what, he was a Christian. I'm not sure which denomination, but he was also a Native American. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he shared was that Native Americans are much more, uh, they don't try to narrow, you know, define things precisely. They're they will allow a, in their practice, there are certain rituals they have, but in their thinking, they're much more um, diverse or open. Open to diversity. And so whatever belief you may have about the great spirit, whatever, um, may be different, but they're very accommodating that and they don't try to. I think that's one of the things that came out of this book was a lot of people are trying to precisely define God and then they want everybody else to have their precision yeah. and then at least all sorts of divisions and splits. And, yeah. and if you don't agree with my God, I'm, I'm gonna beat you up. Yeah, but, it, but in the Native American religions or beliefs, they're much more of a community. Right. Um, right. At least that's the way it came across in the book. Okay, well, uh, we are done with the book. Hopefully uh, you will think about these questions and what you've studied over the last few weeks. Next Sunday, there's no class. There will be a business meeting. And then the two Sundays uh, follow, there'll be no class. And we will resume in January with a new book, which is St. Paul versus St. Peter. So.
glad to have you in class. We're going to go ahead and shut this down, uh, close class, and then uh, turn it over to uh, the worship host. And I, Jonathan, yes, is that the book you're talking about? That you're going to yes, that's the new one. With the class? Yes, that's the next one. Okay, let's see here. Thank you, Jonathan and Jane. You bet. Yeah, thank you both. Who, who, who wrote the, the book? It's uh, it's by Michael Goulder. I don't know if you can see that. There's the author's name. Michael Goulder. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't think it's going to be as painful as this book. Yes. Okay, I'm going to leave. We survived. <laughs> so stay in there, everyone. I'm the only one leaving. Stay. <laughs>